Hi, I'm Ellen Stark, Vice President of New Amsterdam Singers. And I'm really happy to be talking today to former singer, Tara Mack. She sang with New Amsterdam Singers back in the early 2000s. Um, it looks like eight seasons from my looking through old programs. Um, and um, Tara and I had a duet together, which um, Clara remembers to this day as, as one that she really enjoyed. <laughs> I had to look up what it was. In any case, we are really happy that on our March concert, we're gonna be performing a work by, Cla by Tara. And um, so we wanted to talk about that today and learn a little more about how she moved from choral singer, which she still is to composer. Uh, Tara now lives in London with her family and sings with a group called London Oriana, um, where she's a soprano as she was with NAS. Um, so welcome Tara, thanks for being here. And I just wanted to ask, Maybe you could just tell us a tiny bit about your background as a choral singer and um, anything you sort of remember about your time with NAS. Well, thank you, Ellen. I'm so glad to um, reconnect with NAS and I'm um, glad to speak to you today. Uh, yeah, so I've been singing in choirs since middle school, really. Um, most, you know, so middle school and college and then, you know, a few years off and then came back to it. Um, when I lived in London the first time and then came to New York and sang with, with NAS in New York and then moved to Chicago and sang with the Chicago Choral and then back in London again. So I've been, you know, singing with the amateur classical choirs for a long time. It does the experience of singing with London choirs differ very much from uh, your experiences with American choirs? Um, you know, there are little things, but actually the kinds of music that the Oriana performs is actually very similar in a lot of ways to what, um, to what NAS uh, programmed. So I don't know that it's a radically different experience. It's interesting around pronunciation. There's some things around pronunciation, but as, as the choir director that we have, that I work under in London is often saying American choirs work very hard to pronounce things in a British fashion. So in fact, it's not that unfamiliar. He's always, he's talking about it. And actually in some ways is trying to get the choir to pronounce some things more like American. So it's a funny, so that's a little odd, you know, being in these, at least two different sort of pronounce you know two different ways of thinking about pronunciation so that's there's some issues there and definitely um you know i don't know if you know this but there are there, there are, british english uses different musical language to some extent for uh, for certain things when it means like the notes have different names so you don't talk about a half note you talk about a minimum you don't talk about a quarter note you talk about a crotchet so there's getting used to a different language which for the most part obviously english is they're very similar. And so it's sort of strange in this one context to have to a little bit learn another language. Um, but yeah, but otherwise the experience, um, the experience is pretty similar. Also people drink beer that, that I did notice that. And during the intermission, <laughs> sometimes this is less the case now, but the first time I was in a choir in London, people would go to the pub the in the, I mean, choir members would go to the pub <laughs> during the intermission of the concert. So I was like, what are you doing? Where are you going? Hey, don't give anyone I ideas. Really <laughs> and go to a pub definitely after every rehearsal. Yeah, so more well, that pub. sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, more pub stuff. So to transition to composing, because that's um, um, why we're talking today, when did you begin composing? And is it, and it, do you compose choral music exclusively? Or are you also doing some instrumental music? And maybe talk about how you got started there. Sure. Um, so the choir that I'm in now, the Oriana, is coming to the end, actually, of a five-year project dedicated to women composers. Um, and so the idea is to, you know, to promote the work and program the work of women composers. And it's um, called 515 because the idea is that each year the choir commissions a new composer who's, comp who's commissioned to write three pieces. So five times three, 15. So five mm -hmm. composers, five women, 15 pieces over five years. Um, so when we were in the middle of that project, you know, talking a lot about women composers, programming, singing women composers, commissioning women composers, I just at some point, I don't, I can't entirely explain it, but a flip just sort of, sw a switch, excuse me, a switch just sort of flipped in my head. And I thought, actually, I'd like to try doing this myself, which I hadn't really done before, aside from one music theory class when I was in college. Um, and I just, I thought, I'm just wanting, I want to give this a go. I want to see what this is like. I've, you know, I've been in choirs all these years, never written anything. You know, I'd like to see what that's like. So I started trying, you know, and trying and writing, you know, wrote a piece and then thought, oh, maybe I should write another one, wrote another one, you know, and, um, and Harlem Night Song is actually the third piece that I started. So, and um, third piece that I started and fourth that I finished. Um, and it's been strange. <laughs> is were you? I mean, you mentioned a music theory class in college. Other than that, are you self-taught? Did you take any composition yeah, classes as you headed into this? 
No, I have very little mu formal music education. I'm trying to catch up now. So I've been taking some theory classes since um, since I started this composition three years ago. Um, and, but no, and I don't play an instrument, which does, I mean, these things do make it harder, <laughs> admittedly. But I do think that one, another thing that I've done is I've tried to encourage other members of the choir to, to do some, of the choir that I'm in now to do some composition. So we've started a little online class for, uh, for members of our choir who are interested Ooh. in trying composition. And there's been like, you know, maybe about half a dozen of us who are, you know, taking these classes regularly. And so, you know, I would encourage other, you know, members of the NAS as well to think about it. Um, you know, you yeah. don't, I, like, I don't have an extensive music education. I don't even play an instrument. I know there are many, 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 many members of NAS who do. So, you know, I'm building really on my experience as a choral singer. Right. And right. that's certainly enough to get started, you know, and, and to, to explore it and to think that it might be possible for us as singers to write some of the music that we sing, that that's not an impossibility. Um, and so I hope NAS members might, you know, see like other Oriana members saw what I was doing and some of them started to think, oh, maybe I could do this as well. And maybe, you know, the effect will be the same on members of the NAS. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna ask whether your experience as a choral singer sort of informed your compositions. If, you know, you, I don't know how that would be, but if it makes you think differently about placement or, Mm -hmm. harmonies or sort of, you know, you know, the difficulties and what sort of works for the voice and how much does that come into play? Yes. And I, I, I do think, well, first of all, I sort of have this bank of choral music from decades of singing, you know, singing choral music in my head. And I do think that an advantage that we have as singers writing choral music is a, an understanding of singing and understanding of how choirs work. And that is something that we can bring, you know, to composition. Mm -hmm. Whereas often a lot of, I think, because I, I imagine it must, it's probably hard, if not impossible to make a living off of doing choral composing, a lot of composers, right, right. you know, are coming from an instrumental background. Um, so that's something that we can bring to, to that art form is that really understanding. And also I know what, and like, I often think about choir members, the experience of singing, of choral singing, because I think as choir members, we often judge music on the basis of whether or not we like our own part, <laughs> which is maybe yeah, not totally fair. <laughs> you, you gave the altos but, some nice lines, I'll have yes, to Yes, exactly. You know. Like, I do think about the altos, and I think about what does each part have to do here, which I don't even know if that's something that as a composer, one should prioritize, but definitely as a choral singer, very right. good. And we appreciate oh, it. We know who gets to do what, and we you know what. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, I want to move on to Harlem Night Song, uh, which I happen to say the chorus is loving. I mean, we it's oh, really great. beautiful and it's we really enjoy learning it. Um, maybe you could just tell me like what your inspiration for it was. I mean, did you start with the Langston Hughes poem and um, or did you have a thought about a mood you were trying to capture and then felt that poem would work for it? Um, no, you know, I was uh, so <laughs> one, one of the many significant disadvantages I have is in trying to do composition is that I don't have like, so, uh, I, I'm not somebody who's read a lot of poetry over mm. the course of my life, which I never thought of as an, a much of a deficit until now <laughs> when I was thinking, oh, I like to try composing things. And I, it's not like I have this knowledge of all this poetry that I can set this text right. and this text. So I've, I, um, I had wanted to try and set, you know, like to use more famous poem, the, um, I mean, I think it's just called Harlem, but it's, you know, um, Dream Deferred, like we think of it as being called Dream Deferred, right? And I thought, mm -hmm. I started playing around with setting that and total just didn't work, couldn't do it, couldn't do it, like it was a mess and complete collapse. And so I started again, so I was, anyway, I was looking through Langston Hughes' poetry Mm -hmm. and came across this poem and thought, oh, no, this is, this is lovely. This, I think I could, I could try. Um, and really enjoyed, I really enjoyed setting it um, mm -hmm. because I think part of it, cause it's, it's a not, it's not a linear narrative, I guess, in a way. And so being able to play around with not sort of setting it as a, like, and then this happens and then this happens and then this, right. you know, like um, was, was, uh, was fun. So, and, and it's just a lovely poem, isn't it? And it, Har it, it makes, is. you know, makes you think of, Har of having lived in New York and to think of Harlem and the idea of, right. sort of walking through Harlem. Right. I mean, if for, for people who haven't heard it yet, which will be, I think, everyone, except um, how would you, do you have a way to describe the mood or sort of what you think of the sort of, how you would even describe the style of it? Well, it's, oh, the, well, the poem, it's a love poem. And it's, um, and it's, a you know, it's, it's a sort of story of two people or, or I imagine walking through Harlem and experiencing Harlem, you know, um, 
you know, come let us roam the night together yeah. singing. And it has, yeah. you know, singing. So, so, and so the mood, I think the, you know, so the mood is meant to be sort of quite warm, I suppose. Right. Um, and, and, and a bit meandering as well, yeah. because like well, I said, great- it's not a linear, it's not a kind of, then this happened, then this happened piece. So there's something sort of warm and meandering, I think, I hope that comes through. Um, yeah. And we, we noticed that the bases are the only part that gets to say, I love you. I love you. And is that a, is that intentional? Were you thinking of sort of a, a you know, a man and a woman go walking through Harlem and the, the man is the one who's, who turns to the woman? Oh, and says, oh, I love gosh, you. Is that, yes. Clara mentioned this to me. I have to say, I ha- I don't, I, I think one thing I wanted to be careful of was trying not to make it too sort of heterosexual. Like somehow it's definitely a man and woman walking through, you know, like, and so okay. I, and so it was more like the, you know, at one point, um, like the, the Sopranos, are singing this let us roam the night together like they're singing it duet and this and the altos and the tenors are singing it duet but it's not a sort of man woman duet all, all the way along so i was i was conscious of that of not of not wanting to genderize it in that way but i say the thing about the basses being the only one that say i love you i wish i could claim there was some great significance to that but <laughs> i don't i don't think i even fully <laughs> consciously thought about that until clara it mentioned That's it, funny, right. like it. well there's a like, lot of great passages. yes it was definitely there's a lot of passing <laughs> off of parts. I know you mentioned yes, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of like one part takes a little snippet and the next part takes it yeah. and it goes through all the voices. Um, so that sort of speaks to what you're talking about of not having it, you know, genderized and having it be yeah. so specifically a, a, a single couple. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it may be hard to say that you have a style yet. Do you think it's typical of your style or do you think it's your style is something you're still is still evolving and you're still and maybe, you know, you don't want to be boxed in anyway with a mm. particular style. Yeah, no, I don't yet think I consciously have a style. I feel like I'm very much still learning. I'm really, really very much in a sort of learning phase. And so actually it's almost the opposite. Like, you know, we'll be singing something in choir and I'll think, oh, that piece is amazing. I'd love to write a piece that sounds like that. And we'll sing something completely different. And I think, wow, that piece is stunning. I'd love to write a piece that sounds like that. You know, so like, I, you know, so I think really I'm very much in a sort of exploratory Mm-hmm. phase um yeah. and maybe what are you working on i'll be able to come back ellen and tell you all about my style yeah. <laughs> what I'm are you working on now what you know do you have a piece you're in um, the middle of composing so yeah, well okay so what i'm working on now um i've a project i've been working on for a while now which is um it's a collection of quotations so as i mentioned to you poetry not my strong suit however um, i did used to when i was living in the u.s i used to edit a publication for educators that was a social justice play, but so a social justice pu- oriented publication. Mm-hmm. And it was a weekly like diary uh, or a calendar. Mm-hmm. And each week had a quotation by a different like social justice leader or thinker, right? Um, as part of this, you know, larger publication. And so it, one of my jobs as editor was to curate these quotations, 52 quotations every year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so as a result, I built a really big database of quotations of different um, uh, you know, for, uh, different ideas about social justice, people, activists and mm-hmm. lead, uh, leaders. And so I was thinking back on this and thinking, oh, it'd be really neat to take some of my favorite ones. All those years I was collecting all these quotes and I have some that I really like. And what if I took one and then created a set of pieces where each quotation, it, each piece in the set is based on a different quotation. And then each quotation sort of embodies an idea, um, what, what I'm calling virtues of resistance. And so it's mm-hmm. the, these are the kinds of virtues, if you will, that draw one to resisting injustice or that one explores and develops through the process of resisting injustice. And they're just, you know, so like love, faith, community, anger, joy, you know, like all these things are these ideas that you come th- through, come to and come through as part of activism, as part of resistance, as part of struggling against injustice. Mm-hmm. So that I'm still working on this. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's, it's fun. I've been, you know, I've got quotes by Frederick Douglass and I've got quotes by Aaron Dottie Roy and Saul Alinsky. And I'd like to try and do one by Saul Alinsky and um, Fannie Lou Hamer and um, Bell Hooks. And so it's, um, it's been, you know, it's been a fun project. Well, it's interesting you bring up social justice movement because obviously the exper- the events in the, you know, in this country of the last 18 months, two years have sort of led a lot mm-hmm. of arts organizations to really examine their programming and, you know, really take a hard look of whether we were sort of ignoring voices by underrepresented composers, composers mm-hmm. of color, women composers. And, you know, do you feel sort of, 
a connection to that sort of movement and how do you feel that affects you as a composer? Well, yeah, definitely. Like I said, the choir that I'm in now is doing this five-year project on, yeah. um, on women composers. And, and that's been a great experience. And it really does, it illustrates the, that a choir, you know, a, a, can make a real contribution as a choir to, mm -hmm. you know, to fighting sexism in classical music, to promoting the work of women composers or other composers that are unrepresented, like choirs can do that as, you know, like, and I don't know that choirs, you know, particularly amateur choirs necessarily think of themselves as having that kind of power, but they do. And so I think it's definitely worth, you know, individual choirs and choirs working together to, to think about how they can, how they can help, you know, turn around these, um, you know, the, the inequalities in, 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 in music. And so, so it's been great to be part of that project. And um, yeah, I think, and it, but it is, it is, you know, but there are, I, I, there are going to be challenges. Like it's, I think it's not always, always going to be straightforward and easy. And I think choirs have to be prepared to, to kind of navigate those challenges as they're doing this kind of work. Yeah, for sure. Well, this has been really a delight and I want to thank you for your time and you know, it's only about two and a half weeks from now, if that, maybe it's even less that we'll be singing, we'll be um, singing Harlem Night Song and we're really looking forward to it. And I think yeah, we're going to see I'm, you at- and Yes, you I'm going to come to New York. Time? It'll be great to be back in New York. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm super honored and excited that NAS is performing. And thank you guys so much for doing this. And I can't wait to come yeah. hear it in rehearsal and then come to the concerts. Great, great. We look forward to seeing you. Great.